Hey there, this is Ivan from Scale FT. We are here in sunny yet incredibly windy Las Vegas. Some folks are here this week for AWS reInvent, other folks for Gartner IM Summit, and much more folks here to lose all of the money. As luck would have it, I'm here for all three reasons. And I'm lucky to be here with Eric Wright, who is uh, Director of Technical Marketing at Turbonomic. Uh, Eric and I go way back. He's a, a well-known figure in the, in the enterprise software space, does uh, amazing community advocacy and technical advocacy across uh, a number of, of groups. So it's really, uh, really nice chatting with you. Yeah, thanks, it's good Ivan. to see you. So reInvent, how many years is it for you? This is the second as a sponsor yeah. and a longtime fan. You know, first time, long time. Sure. Uh, we've, uh, <laughs> it's kind of neat because I've been involved in you know general cloud stuff for a lot, lot longer. Mm -hmm. But being able to actually be at the show and, and have an active presence, we're sure. actually like platinum sponsors for yeah, Tronomics. Yeah, no, that's so we got great. A, a giant, giant booth, cool. and it's it's cool. You know, it, it's really, really good to be here again. We were here last year. That's right. As a, a bit of a smaller presence, uh, and it was great to see you know, what your team's doing, what the rest of the ecosystem's doing. I yep. love just seeing it's much more than what we came from. Yeah, <laughs> right? Well, great. Well, tell us a little bit about uh, what Turbonomic does. Yes, yeah, so Turbonomic is a... don't know. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I got to do the official pitch here. Uh, so Turbonomic, we're a hybrid cloud management platform uh, where we assure workload performance while making sure you utilize your infrastructure as efficiently as possible, which when you get to the public cloud, is especially important because it's costing you by the hour or by the minute. Uh, and also maintaining important uh, compliance use cases around business policies and such. Right. Uh, so it's pretty cool, but effectively, you know, we've been working in the data center space for a long time, so being able to spread into hybrid cloud, so making sure we know like what workloads to run where, uh, how to get the performance you need on 30% less spend, and then mostly being able to actively control and automate to create self-managing cloud operations. Perfect, and for those who have been surprised by their monthly cloud bills, this is a great solution. Now, we're obviously here for AWS reInvent, so everything is very AWS heavy, but as a, as a hybrid cloud vendor, how do you navigate the waters of the different cloud vendors and play nicely as a community advocate? <laughs> yeah, it's funny, you, you, I mean, because we really have to be an arbiter of what's important, which is the, the corporate need, right? Which is truly customer requirements and workloads. AWS talks about this being customer-centric. Right. And it's like, I, oh, that sounds amazing. You're like, well, I think actually everybody should be customer-centric. Yeah. But, but we've seen it that being able to, to adapt adapts the workloads, which is why we as a company are very agnostic to what's underneath and above us. Uh, so we are full stack from application through virtualization cloud down to physical layer. So it's kind of neat that we have to purposefully abstract every layer of the infrastructure, otherwise we effectively lock ourselves in. So we right. try and be the, the unlock abstraction to give people freedom to be their platform that they want. So that's, that's our platform and then however they want to map to it, you know, but, you know, multi-cloud, what's cool is that people are wanting to get the best of breed for each right. thing. And that kind of opens right. the door to making sure that they like, hey, if I want to do AI stuff, I mean, like they've made some really cool announcements around ML and AI around, you know, what AWS is doing. Mm -hmm. However, you know, that, that Google other, does great things that other, too. <laughs> that other search company happens to be particularly good at that. Right, right. And so when we have customers who are looking at stuff like what the Microsoft Azure ecosystem has to offer, we need to be able to be in the middle of delivering what we do on all those platforms as well as right. what's on premises. Totally. So. Yeah, you can get the best of both worlds, but you know, some sort of single pane of glass. Obviously, you want to. You know, interact I'm with gonna, the right. I have to shut you down now. I can't. I, 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 so I'm a I'm a firm believer, and as and I, not I'm, saying I'm that. Derail you. <laughs> I'm a firm believer that there is no such thing as a single right. pane of glass. There are multiple single panes of glass. So, <laughs> sorry, single. Okay. But it, no, you're right. You're, right, you're absolutely you, right. The, the, well, the follow-up was going to be, but you still want to have the direct interfaces with the right abstraction yeah. layers that maximizes the most value. So, yeah, there's definitely not a, a single Yeah, thing and I, I think of it, and I, sh I shouldn't really <laughs> be so negative. It's really more that yeah, I, I, no matter how good my platform is, it's mm -hmm. not the place that people go to do day-to-day -day operational stuff. My goal is to be the easy button that's automated sure. behind the scenes. As, I mean, obviously you guys are pretty familiar with that. People shouldn't be going into your product all the time. The whole idea is like you, you do it and then it does it. Like right. it's, you're out of that. It's, it's sort of like the Ron Popeil set yeah, and forget it. But if it you need to know what was going on, you can always kind of take a peek. Right. right. Yeah, you know, our, our kind of view of, of multi-cloud and hybrid cloud is, is um, you know, maximizing the, the, the native capabilities of all of the platform's environments. 
decoupling certain areas that are clear lock-in, and a lot of those, you know, identity governance is a big lock-in. You know, this is why Azure ecosystem is so strong, is Azure yeah. AD and Google, obviously, with, with G Suite. Still waiting for AWS to announce their identity provider solution. Uh, but if you kind of try to decouple some of the logic around this stuff, you get the capabilities of, of multi-cloud. But it, it's hard because you have to have the right abstraction layers, and I think we both deal with that challenge, um, but it's a, it's a good one. So, you know, and we probably see it and you see it too, but you know, just tell me a little bit about the, um, the business drivers that you see for wanting to be multi-cloud and hybrid cloud versus, you know, going all in on one vendor. There's a lot of really key use cases. The, one of the most common one that comes up that drives multi-cloud strategy is acquisition. So mm. companies are leveraging, you know, services of other companies which require using their platform. You know, and we see the stuff like with Walmart, they put a hard line in the sand. Like if you're going to be a technology partner of us, you can't be on Amazon, right? Because we run our own cloud. Right. So those kind of things will, will occur, but they can't be so hard lined. So yeah. a financial services company, insurance companies, there's lots of, you know, healthcare verticals that are going to be locked in to some degree to one thing, but then they partner with another company or they integrate with another company who's locked into the other thing. Yeah. So how do you be the arbiter of those two platforms. And that's right. really the big one. And then ultimately it's just, like I cut, talked before, like a service that I want that's better in one place than sure. the other. And that's the real freedom. Obviously we look at Kubernetes, that's unlocking the ability to leverage things. The old hybrid thing. Although now they're all just going to be built in as managed Kubernetes well, services. That's it, What's right? that going to do? That's going to be interesting. Managed but still, Kubernetes, the idea yeah. is that yes, you can move containers around. When we looked <laughs> two to three years ago at what hybrid cloud was meant to be, it was mm -hmm. this idea that you had a workload spinning on site, and then it would get busy, and it would burst to the cloud. Right. It's a terrible idea, <laughs> right? This, there, we realized that pattern was not the one that was going to be used. I fell victim to that one. We, 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 yeah, I talked about the it two first, years ago. We sent the yeah. application, and <laughs> right. we left the data behind. Right. Oh, so let's send the data there. Oh, well, where do we, how do we keep the secure the data? Yeah. And then identity becomes yeah. this big thing of... Well, serverless might have spawned from a little bit of that because yeah. it's about these really short list stateless jobs that you just want to fire off and execute on an event. That was, it was, that's cloud bursting from the same cloud to the same cloud, but it's right. this, you know, same kind of mindset. But yeah, the, the concept of just spinning workloads and then sending them somewhere based on some kind of demand, there's a lot of missing pieces like, yeah, identity and state, so. <laughs> it's good for us, spot on. <laughs> as far as like what we've seen as well is that when people are shopping, they want to be not just an arbiter, but a mm -hmm. true broker and understanding like, well, when I talk about what workloads to run where, it's the idea of right. like, what the true cost is of running it, because on-prem, you had the like sunk costs, you had, you know, and if you're a fan of Kahneman and Tversky and the like, that sort of economics and, and behavioral uh, economics and heuristics, there's this thing of like sunk cost fallacy and all these right. things that come into play that we think like, oh, we own it. So like we can keep using it, but they were misusing it. And sure. so we've found success there. And now when people want to go to the cloud, again, like two years ago, we're like, oh, don't go to the cloud, it costs money. Well, yeah, but so does the <laughs> sunk so does cost that yeah. you've got. Right. So we see the same thing. And again, so now it's not just being an arbiter, but truly being a broker mm -hmm. so that you can have a place where you go that's able to be that abstraction. Right. And, you know, again, like identity stuff. That's why I love, I'm a fan of what your team is doing. Great, yeah. Because it's, it's a big gap because people think, right. I like the services there, but I don't know that I trust it. Right, yeah, so just to recap on that one. So what we're, we're kind of decoupling a lot of the auth logic from the network layer and removing, you know, the identity system of record is an input into making a, an authorization decision. But that authorization decision is happening in a kind of neutral environment. And it's, you know, the cloud platform, it's all, it's, it's agnostic. Um, but, you know, we're finding that, you know, a lot of people are most comfortable with one platform. You know, they might have 80% in one, one and 20 in another. Um, you know, that it's, 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 it's hard to see like a, you know, a fully distributed, just kind of you know, on-demand, uh, kind of real-time uh, um, changing of that. So what you guys are working on is pretty, pretty impressive. Are you finding that it's, it's, it's people are more concerned about you know, cost savings in terms of you know, splitting uh, workloads, or is it, is it also services and APIs or both? Yeah, yeah cost <laughs> savings was barrier one, and it, what, what's, what's funny is more people adopt it, it's the cost of doing business. We've yeah. moved the model to accept it, now what we want to do is we're willing to spend, like companies are willing to spend, but they want to do it as efficiently as possible. They right. want to make sure that they're getting the most effective spend. So if we can you know, shave that down by 30%, it's pretty sure. attractive, yeah. especially because then they're, it's, they're not really looking to save that 30%. They're looking to reinvest that 
sure. in adopting other services. And that means that they can get back to you know, innovation and mm -hmm. like actually doing new work instead of busy work and, right. and, and all that good stuff. So. Right. Yeah, it makes sense. And you know, the, the keynote this morning from, from uh, Andy Jassy, you know, the, the three flavors of really compute in the Amazon world, you know, the, the instance container and then the, the Lambda function. You know, and, and it's not always just about cost. It's, it's, you know, it's about picking the right environment for the right workload. But you know, obviously, the on-demand pricing of, of Lambda is <laughs> really attractive for, um, for a lot of folks. Um, but, we had uh, one of the yeah. customer <laughs> use cases we had. It was pretty wild. They had, they had 4,000 VMs. And it literally cost them four million dollars in their first year of use <laughs> because they didn't understand sure. what it was they needed to do. They were sizing like we did on premises, like, yeah. And so they were over provisioning to make sure they had. They thought capacity means performance, so they they followed. They fell victim to the same problem, and they stopped their migrations because it was like, wow, we can't. There's no way we can double our workloads out there. It's going to kill us. So we were able to work with them and go through and realize that we could ratchet that back. And we talked, I think that was like a 60% savings in nice. and still delivering the same performance, sure. but like using, you know, using a machine and software to do, make sure that it was doing the right thing and achieving both performance and cost together. Right. Cause it's not just, let's solve this one thing. I'm like, oh, I can save you money, but your performance is going to be you know, abysmal. Sure. So I need you to do, do both, both together right. and even more so now we've got people that aren't having to worry about data locality, data sovereignty, and all this crazy stuff. So yeah. then they need to make sure they don't violate those policies. And right. But it's a, it's a great feeling when they get it and they see it for the yeah. first time, the difference. It's, it's always just like that aha moment, you know. Some, some people are like, damn it, I've been screwing up this whole time. And others are like, oh, this is, this is, this is what exactly what I'm looking for. Yeah, and talk um, about compelling yeah. events. Like, <laughs> you mean, you're, what you see, like, compelling events get people fired, right? Like, it's... it's well, yeah, <laughs> that's the thing, you know. You know, we're, you know, obviously, as a security company, we, uh, we, we point to a lot of the, the, the trends, and it seems like every week we read about something more damaging than the last, you know. Um, but, you know, we're also looking at it from a kind of a proactive productivity standpoint is... You know, if you, you know, remove barriers from workflows um, and just encourage better security across your company, everyone's just going to be happier. Um, your, your security is going to be better just by people being more aware of their kind of in environments and surroundings. And, you know, that's not just about passing compliance. You know, it's not just about writing policy. It's about actually yeah. adhering to those policies in an effective way that everybody kind of, you know, believes in uh, from a workflow standpoint. And you know, it's it, it's it's mirrors the kind of DevOps movement around productivity. You know, it was you know mean time to delivery was the big metric for uh, a lot of the early DevOps days. You know, and now in uh, in, in security, it's it's you know productivity uh, is is how fast people can get to the things they need to get to. Uh, you know, like without logging through a VPN, which is why right. we have the shirt because <laughs> everybody loves that. Um, so well, yeah, I think those are similar problems. Yeah, <laughs> it spawns the whole mobile device management. Oh, yeah. this has become a core thing to every every big enterprise organization. It's a big one. The right. challenge that a lot of companies that we talk to, you know, I mean, it, it, it sounds nice to just have you know all your devices managed and inventoried, but it's really hard in yeah. practice. Um, and you know, but BYOD on the flip side just introduces so many headaches for for IT people. And if you need device state as an input into a decision making process. You need to get that device state somehow, which means you got to run something on everyone's device, and that's a hard thing to you know convince a lot of a lot of companies. Um, but if you look at it from a, a employee posture perspective, um, that's where you, you can make a better case. It's it's not necessarily you know run this you know mega endpoint protection uh, service on your mobile phone. It's you know hey we just we need to know if the disk is encrypted or if the OS is up to date. Yeah, uh, and that's you know in order to effectively evaluate, you know, what we can let you do as an employee. And if, if you don't pass something, we'll tell you why. You know, hey, go run this software update. Here's a knowledge base article on, on what to do. And, you know, Google found, you know, my favorite stat from the BeyondCorp papers is that when they rolled out their BeyondCorp system, they, they had a 30% reduction in IT support tickets because the employees knew what to do. They didn't have to go call IT if they got locked out of the VPN anymore. They, they immediately yeah. just, they read what the message, and it was in plain English, and it told them what to do. Um, and that just encourages better security. Um, and that, you know, over time, that, that pays off big time. So, you know, I, I think all of these cloud initiatives on, on both sides that we're, we're, we're working on to pay off, <laughs> obviously, that's what we're banking our businesses on. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and if you think about if, the barry, if there's any impact or any, any slowdown to getting to services they need, 
they're going to go around it. Yes, that's the big one. That's right. People are pretty smart these days. Yeah. <laughs> Circumventing access controls, you know, uh, defeats the purpose of having them in the first place, right? So if you have, yeah, if you get locked out of VPN, but you you can find a nice way to tunnel your SSH connection, you know, and you're going to do that, um, and you know that just not good for the management of the company or you know who instilled the policy, and not good for. Uh, the user who is, you know, working around what, you know, supposed to. So, yes, a problem we're trying to definitely solve. Uh, <laughs> so you spent some time on the show floor today. Uh, anything um, exciting that you you ran into? Uh, familiar faces. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because you know what, everybody. That's why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that been helps. At, I've been at a lot of shows, but what's cool is that it used to be. So I came out of the virtualization community originally, mm -hmm. but before that, I was a PowerShell kid. I was a I was a Microsoft Active Directory person. Yep. I did a lot around directory services management and, and automation. Then that led me, and I became the open the, the the Active Directory guy. Then I became the VMware guy. Then I became the OpenStack guy. Then the Kubernetes. So like whatever it is, I'm kind of rolling with what the industry is sure. doing because I have to. I have to try and map to what's going on. So what I see down there is VMware, you know, obviously not Microsoft, but you yeah. know, people that are using Microsoft backend ecosystems. Mm -hmm. They're everybody's in everybody's backyard right, right now, and it's it's cool to see that everyone's arriving here. You know, I used to be an outlier because I was at the OpenStack summit, and the next thing you know, VMware, Microsoft, like right. Google, everybody had a had their 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 you know thumb in that pie. They were trying to get involved, and they were doing neat stuff to grow that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And then we surpassed it. We were like, all right, we made this cool, but we also made it commoditized. So like, let's move further up the stack, and then that moved to containerization. Right. And we just rolled right past Docker <laughs> and got to <laughs> Kubernetes. Oof, and, yep, that, that's and true. And now we even. So my favorite thing is that Kubernetes and like we're way off like we're way off topic. I don't even know what we're talking about. No, but this is, this is this is meant to be off topic. So what <laughs> what happened was Kubernetes. There was a great tweet that came out. It was like a day or two ago, but from Kelsey Hightower. Kelsey's yep. a phenomenal, a great leader in a community, a, a phenomenal person uh, who does a lot of stuff. And you know, obviously, developer advocacy in Kubernetes is really cool. Mm -hmm. And what he acknowledged was he says that basically Kubernetes is not the thing. Right. But in fact, this is going to enable the next thing. And I right. was like, yes, that's, it the, the, that's yeah, it. It's not, it's, it's not the platform, it's the platform to build a platform or something like that, right. I think it was. And, yeah. and I said, I, I wholly agree. I have seen that too, yes. And it is, it, will be, I, it, it is going to be the stepping stone to what really is right. what we are going to build on. And I think we saw that's what Fargate became today, this morning with the AWS announcement, or I say this morning, we're, we've time locked to when this is going to get released, <laughs> including the gong of the yeah, bell in the right, background yeah. where that clock came Who from. Who was this morning? This will be out later yeah. today. Um, <laughs> so what we see is that we've accepted that this is the mid layer and that we're now targeting further up. Yeah. And like obviously you, your team is in the same kind of business. Like right. let's just get past these bits and let's get to the actual workflow. Let's get to how yep. to better consume this stuff and then the abstraction layer becomes way less important. Right. And people think that's, they're like, oh, isn't that bad? It's like, fun no, to work is... on that, the yeah. abstraction layers, but it's, it's the, it, the outcome is, is, is meant to be the services and APIs you consume. Yeah. And I always remember um, James Waters of Pivotal always had a good one when he talks about, he, he draws the, basically the cloud stack and he draws the value line, yeah. right? All container orchestration and infrastructure is below the value line, everything, APIs, services above the value line. And you know, I think I totally believe in that. And you know, Kubernetes is that abstraction that's happening under under the hood. Um, but I'm really excited to see some of the services that people build on top of it. I mean, like Pachyderm IO is one of my favorites. Yeah. I mean, they were early early Kubernetes building, basically a, a Hadoop alternative. You know, around uh, um, built on Kubernetes. And I, I know the founders really well. They you know some of the use cases they they talk about are really cool. Some really cool big you know data science use cases that are. You know, Kubernetes is under the hood, but they're exposing, you know, basically a, a containerized runtime for, for uh, you know, high, you know, data science workloads. Um, so that's where like, I'm really excited to see the next step of, of, uh, of uh, abstractions coming out of the community and obviously the, the vendors. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, and I like, what I like is when you walk around the expo floor, you see customers. Like yeah. obviously two big ones, a little little video streaming company that we may know, and another <laughs> large, and our credit card and banking company that we know. Yeah. Right, Capital One and, and Netflix yep. are are great. They're powerful presenters. Expedia doesn't have a booth, but they have lots of presentations. Yep, they have the keynote. Uh, yeah. And so it's neat to see 
that they are embracing that. I mean, it's probably a recruiting event for them, truthfully. Oh, big time, yeah, know? for sure. Yeah. So it, that tells you about the power of this. And so we have 43,000 people this year. We had 34,000 last year. In 2012, so five years ago, there were 4,000 people. Yeah, I So we've, five years ago, that was how many were here in total. And yet we've grown by more than that in one year. Wow. Like, Versus Wait, were you, were all you the talking other about attendees or the price of Bitcoin? I, I, yeah, I, exactly. I, I zoned out for they're a minute one in the there same. a second. Yeah. It's a, <laughs> so we can see this you know, sort of yeah, hockey stick type of growth that's going on. Now, will it plateau? Well, <laughs> I don't know. But I think uh, you mentioned it earlier on, on kind of the path that you've taken professionally. I think it shows that the, the, the community has kind of been the same and we, we've just all evolved. Yeah. And, you know, and, you know, we came from virtualization, you know, we you know, worked in the container world, you know, OpenStack, and now kind of cloud native. Same people, yeah. <laughs> which is great, you know, and uh, is, I, I think being a, a community advocate in that, in that world is, is exciting and fun because, yeah. you know, everybody is, is, is you know, moving forward, and we're always continually progressing. You know, we all have day jobs and businesses to, to promote, but uh, I think at the end of the day, everybody's just trying to solve problems, you know, real business problems and challenges for, for, our, for our customers and users out there. So, testament to seeing the big companies out here, you know, learning new stuff, giving talks about what they've learned. Um, it's always, always an exciting time here. Yeah, being open, you know, obviously I've got a lot of roots in open source. I'll yep. be at KubeCon, you know, which oh, is yeah, coming up next week. This. All right. And, and you see, <laughs> You know, the, what, what open communities and open source projects uh, have done for us, or I should say projects, I forget I'm Canadian. Yeah, it's it's okay. Process and project <laughs> and about, I say funny apparently. Nice. Uh, <laughs> so we look at what that's done and the customer stories and their presentations to think that's a, that's a powerful thing for a company that has a fiduciary responsibility to its shareholders to share how they run their infrastructure. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, right? that's a testament to what it is. Like, you know. For Same like, with security. People, yeah. you know, used to be really hesitant to talk about security, but now yeah. it's, 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 a, it's a promotion, you know. Yeah. It's, if you do things right, I mean, the Google wrote five research papers about their internal security practices. Yeah. You know, why? Well, you know, they wanted to talk about all the things that they built and why they, you can trust their cloud as an enterprise is one, obviously, but, you know, it, it's, it, it's a good promotional tool is to is to talk about how you know the things that you're building working on and you know how secure you are um, ten years ago it was it was you know that was no one was sharing that kind of information so yeah, yeah it's great now and yeah open source is a big driver of that because you know that's kind of the catalyst for so much of it we'll see more as we go and you know again like so if you think the importance again we're looking at what your team's doing and what a lot of folks are doing the why is the lead the how Pretty cool, right? Got a bunch of papers. Look at the Beyond Corp story, like that style. Yeah. And then the, all right, show me, right? Yeah. <laughs> like Morpheus, right? You know, yes. that that's it. You're like, all right, let's let's see this in action. And it's yeah. cool to be able to see people first understand why. Like you said, that aha, like whew, we right. need, we need this kind of thing in place. And it's people are more accepting now because they know the the aha moment of aha, we've been breached, yeah. versus the aha moment of I want to avoid that. Yeah, you know, and I, I'm just finding in just in the last 12 months alone, you know, more people are aware. Um, obviously, I mean, security is the top of mind of so many, so many people just because of the high profile breaches. But, you know, pe people want to get ahead of it. But I think, I, you know, I'm, I think it's the, for the right reasons, you know, it's, it's not, you know, we don't want to be on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. I mean, I'm sure they're thinking that, but, you know, they come to us and say, hey, listen, we, we, we believe there's a better way to be doing this. You know, yeah. we sp we've invested in the cloud. Um, you know, what is, what is, you know, why are we still doing all security this kind of legacy way? You know, why are we using the network as the way to grant trust? We, we just, can you, uh, can you help us find a better way? And, you know, yes, and, and as a matter of fact, we can. And here's, you know, here's Google's own implementation of this. And, you know, what we do at Scale of T is, is, is try to uh, make that consumable, basically, as a service. So it's exciting times for, for both of us. As a service, all the things, that's yes. what I say, you know. <laughs> Ass all the things. No. <laughs> We've been here for a long time today, but. Uh, as my favorite yes. thing, as I said, the, <laughs> we've actually, what's cool, you know, one last thing to drop in on is that enterprises are, are interesting that they're adopting these next generation technologies, but it's also a, rem a reminder that we have to keep one foot in the data center, one foot in what's next, <laughs> and we're yeah. bridging, right? Sure. So it's, as much as the abstractions are important, also it's the fact that we have to, the reason why we have to abstract is because we have to bridge multiple things, right. including on-prem and the cloud, cloud to cloud, yeah. you know, paths to cloud, all these different things, and that's why 
those stuff, stuff. that yeah. style is different and I, I called the ad, the as a service hole the AAS you know who, <laughs> who is the firm belief that legacy computing yep. needs to die and it should I'm like no no IBM's mainframe business rising you know tape business for right. for archival hey. rising it's all about the workload. <laughs> but what's what's important is that at the same time that's still rising is we are doing so much more yes. in these next generation technologies. Absolutely. And what are we doing? It's it's further up the stack. Yeah, it's, absolutely. That's where the, the real cool stuff goes on. Absolutely. Great. Well, this was uh, this is great. It was really nice talking with you, chatting with you. Any any predictions for uh, tomorrow's? Keynote by Werner. Well, this is going to be out. There, so, just so. what what shirts what shirt is Werner going to be wearing? Oh, that's is he, a good is question. Gonna, it's a trans. We had yeah. Transformer last yeah. year. Uh, I love so Werner's presentation style is always cool, uh, and it, it's going to be neat. Obviously, it'll be a bit, bit more technical focus. Yeah, even even is, Andy's yeah. stuff is very it's technical, but yeah. you understand why. Everybody's waiting for the big one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's going to be neat. It'll be the the get the engineers jumping up and down on some stuff. Yep. Either way. It's going to be a big show. Um, I'm super happy to be involved with it. I'm happy to be able to share the stage with you here. You know, yeah, and, absolutely. And to be able to, to spend time with you and your community. And thanks for no, you know, thank what you. you and the team are doing to, to help keep awareness and, and keep growing communities around all this stuff. Great. Likewise. So where can people find you online? Uh, I'm easy to find. I'm <laughs> Disco Posse. If you can look, I'm, in, I'm Disco Posse on Twitter. Also in the Green Circle community, which is my open community for Turbonomic. Just go to greencirclecommunity.com, search for Disco Posse. It's easy to find me there. Uh, and, of course, turbonomic.com. Uh, and my personal blog is discoposse.com. Nice. Where I may or may not actually get some notes about the keynotes up. In now, the, I've never actually asked time. you the origin of Disco Posse. Ah, well, that was, I, I, I was in many bands as a, as a young gentleman. And, okay. and uh, one of them we did were, like, hardcore versions of disco songs. Uh, so we did like all like disco songs in the style of like Tool, sure. so very heavy melodic. <laughs> it was actually it was kind of neat. That must have been fun. And it's we were, be first in the we would Guinness, open but for metal, right? We'd actually yeah. open for ourselves, so we had like a, a an all original like hard hard metal band, whatever. Nice. Uh, and so we would be openers for ourselves and, and don this tunes. giant nice. um, afro, and we were the disco posse. Awesome. We had like we had Crack Monkey Disco Posse. We had all these different names that we made up. And so That's cool. back well, in the day, there it is. Yeah. I picked the name and, and yeah. it stuck. Well, similarly, you can find me on Twitter at, at 45 in because and I'm Ivan and I collect old 45 records. So 45 in. So similar origin story on how where you can find me. But uh, thank you again for joining. You awesome. can uh, find us online, scalet.com and or turbonomic.com. All right, enjoy. <laughs>